Thank you, John and Grace. What a blessing it is to um, see our young ones involved in our services. Uh, it is often said that the church is a reflection of those you see on the pulpit. And as you've noticed, uh, we are a multicultural church. Not only that, it's a multi-generational church. Where not only do we believe that um, people like Dave can wear a barong, <laughs> but also that we could have our young people here serving the Lord. Amen. At South Bay, we want to provide an environment um, where that is welcomed. Amen. And it's such a blessing when I got here to see the diversity in this church, because I believe this is a little taste of what heaven will be like. Even though oftentimes you'll have different ethnic pastors that will come and preach and say that uh, we'll be speaking Samoan in heaven, or we'll be speaking another language in heaven, uh, I truly believe we'll be speaking all sorts of languages. I can't even fathom the conversations and the communications that we'll have with each other, but even more so our Father. I just want to just touch on a few things before I get into prayer. Um, I always like to do a review and kind of take us back to where we were, to where we are at today. Um, our church has been in a season of prayer, as I mentioned. It is a season of prayer to see what direction God is taking South Bay. But not only that, we don't want to just pray for the church. We're very intentional in one of our sermons to challenge our church members to pray for three names. Three names. The first name was somebody that is close to you, maybe a neighbor, a family, um, somebody that God has placed on your heart. The second name was actually somebody within your community, maybe somebody that you work with, uh, somebody that the Lord might ask uh, you to approach and to witness to, um, maybe not uh, sharing the Bible, but just by simply um, socializing with them, communicating with them, offering them to, uh, to sit down and have a meal. A lot of times witnessing takes place um, in social spaces. Um, and we've got to understand that we've got to be the sermon before we preach the sermon. The third thing was this, to look around us and, and again, look at the empty seats here. There are non-active members that I want you to pray for that the Lord will put on your heart. Um, myself and Fred, and we're, getting, we're trying to get together with some of our elders to put together a visiting list, to not only visit the members that are active, but especially those that aren't attending. We want to make sure that um, we want to be faithful to, to, to that which God has placed before us. You see, the challenge was this. It's, it was so much easier back in the 80s when I was growing up to get people to come to church by a simple invite. But things have changed now. It's not about getting them into the church. It's actually now we got to get people in the church to the community and to the homes of those that aren't here. So what happened was this past week, I was in um, intensives um, trying to finish up my master's through Andrews University's Map Men courses. And as I was uh, studying, uh, the, the class that I was taking is a missiology um, class. It's a course that is studying on cross-cultural servanthood in the religious context. And we went by this, uh, this, this quote in the spirit of prophecy in the desire of ages. And as soon as I read that quote, I said to myself, this is actually the past four sermons that I preached in this just one paragraph. Everything that we've walked through can be found in this passage here. Now, I want you to understand this. It's like if you, if, if you haven't been here um, last week or the week before, you missed a few sermons, I'm, I'm going to give this quote to you so that if you could just get this quote, you'll, you'll, you'll be caught up to where we're at today. All right. Amen. You'll be caught up to where we are at today. So Desire of Ages uh, in page 151, it reads this. It says, Jesus saw in every soul one to whom must be given the call to his kingdom. Remember, we talked about a kingdom mindset the other Sabbath. So there you go in the kingdom. So God is inviting us to model after him and inviting other people, right, to understand this kingdom concept. And remember what we said in the Bible was this, is that the Bible is about two things. It is about a king and his kingdom. Now, there's two different kingdoms. and There's man's kingdom and there's God's kingdom. And we've got to figure out which kingdom are we following after. Then it goes and says, he reached the hearts of the people by going among them as one who desired their good. We have a God that desires our good. His motives and his tensions are always on point. It is a God who wants your good. It's just after the song. He is a good, good father. Okay. So he goes on to say, he sought them in, watch this now, I love this, in public streets, in private houses, 
on the boats, in the synagogues. He's making a mention that not only does he ask us to reach people where they're at in our community, at their workplace, in their homes, but he mentions that also in the synagogue. So he's not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. He's just suggesting not only should we reach each other here in the church, but we should emphasize reaching those outside of the church. He says, by the shores of the lake, and I love this, and at the marriage feast. He met them at their daily vocations and manifested an interest Remember what we talked about last week in their what? Secular. Secular, secular affairs. Last week we talked about this idea that we tend to compartmentalize what is spiritual and what is secular. Right? But, but coming from a mindset and understanding what the scripture tells us that everything was made by God for God. It makes us understand this idea that, guess what? If we are to be the church, wherever we go, the church goes. So he meets them where he carried his instructions to the household, bringing families in their own homes under the influence. We also talked about this last week of what? His divine presence. Remember, last week's sermon was living in the presence of God, how that would shape our life and the shape the way that we did life, how we thought, how we served, how we gave. And then we're just going to end by saying this, his strong personal sympathy helped to win hearts. He often repaired to the mountains for solitary prayer. But this was a preparation, it says, for his labor among men in active life. This idea of active life brought me to this point. So we challenged everybody to pray for three things, and then it was this idea that we would pray, we would plan, and who remembers the last one? And we would practice patience. But after reading this last portion of this um, quote out of the Spirit of Prophecy, in an active life, I want to add one more in there because I think I skipped, uh, I skipped, a, I skipped a, 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 a stage here. So let's add this to it. Not only should we pray, but we should plan, right? And then we should practice, right? We should practice and then patience. So if I were to switch this up, I just, the Lord just gave this to me. We should have practice and then patience. Would you say amen? Let's, let's pray as we get into the word of God. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege it is for us to gather together as a community, as a body of Christ. And Lord, as we sit before your feet to receive your word, we pray, God, that you would make it plain and that you would make it simple, that we may understand and not only practice it, but Father, may we, just like you have done, make your word become flesh. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I was very fascinated uh, when my son decided to do uh, literature evangelism uh, last summer. Fascinated for the fact that I've understood that there's a lot of, uh, of our young people who have gone out there by faith, knocking on doors, selling books, and, and getting to a point in their faith walk where uh, they are so bold in what they do, right, that it removes not only the, the, the fear, but the, timid, the, the timidness of them uh, trying to spread the gospel and sharing the good word of Jesus Christ through literature. And it also that it, it brings them to a point where I, I remember him saying something uh, to this um, extent. He said um, it, it wasn't so much about selling books anymore. You, you get to a point where it's about reaching the people. And uh, this past week, I was in class with one of my good colleagues in ministry, and he had shared an experience that he had when he was co-porting uh, in a very, very rough part of town. If, if, I'm, if I'm correct, I don't know, I think it was somewhere down in, uh, in Detroit, and uh, he spent the entire week on this one block. So they map out these different blocks, and they, they send people out in different teams, and they says, this is the street that you will do for the entire week. So they spend the entire week, right, trying to canvas this one area. So he said as, as, as he went Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, he said he was, he was really enjoying his experience and how he was able to share the good news, pray with people in their homes, and try to, at some point, try to introduce them to Jesus. He said when it finally got to Friday, he ended up at the end of the block, right? It was a really long street. He says he finally got to the last house um, that was on his route and in the areas that he was supposed to canvas. And he says this, this gentleman was washing his car. And in the middle of washing his car, he walks up to him and says, sir, how you doing? And he says, I, I, I'm, I'm here to, uh, just to see and, and pass out some literature and see if you're, you're very interested in, in, in any of these books. He says, do you have a family? And he says, as he started to uh, uh, build a conversation with this, this man, this man kept looking at him and saying, where did you come from? And he says, what do, what do you mean, sir? He says, 
where did you come from? He says, well, I, I, I'm a, a, a student working for uh, funds and tuition to help pay my way through college, and I've been uh, canvassing uh, this block uh, for the entire week. He says, the entire week you've been on this block? He says, yes, why? And he was so amazed because what he came to realize is that the man said this. He goes, this, is, this, this block is known to be one of the worst areas in the city. He goes, so much so that they stop, uh, they stop uh, public transportation. No buses come through here. No taxis. Nothing comes through this because people were always getting mugged or robbed or some type of, some type of criminal activity was taking place for people, especially those that aren't from the area. And he goes, I'm surprised you survived this entire week. He was so, he was so shocked to see this young man. At his, he said, he stopped washing the car, and with, with, with suds and bubbles still on the car, he told him, get inside the car, drove him back to the church and told him, please, don't, don't, don't ever walk on these streets by yourself again. He says, bubbles were still flying out there. That's how serious... He, this, this place was as far as danger is concerned. Now, the reason why I share this is because this, uh, the, today's word is called stay woke. And, and, and some of you are like, uh, okay, what does that mean? But I'm looking at a lot of young people and a lot of our millennials, and they know exactly what that terminology means. And I'm going to give you a little refresher course on how you can communicate with our young people. Would you say amen? Because the word stay woke is oftentimes used up by today's millennial Generation Z demographic to mean this, keeping informed of the chaos going around us in times of turmoil and conflict, especially when the media is heavily being filtered. I'm just going to leave that right there. You make of it what you want. Young people use this term to stay woke because there's all this stuff going around us. Here's this young man walking down the street in the midst of danger, not understanding the chaos and the trouble and the challenges that face until he gets to the end of the block. Our young people are saying this to each other. You got to stay woke. And there's something for us to learn from the younger generation. I think oftentimes we tend to brush them off and not really giving them the time of day. But I, when, they, when I heard this quote, it hit straight to my heart. And I says, I got to use that in a sermon. Because this idea that we are walking around not understanding the chaos and the challenges that are facing us is something that we need to bring back into our control and understand there is, a, there is a reality that we're faced with that a lot of us are sleeping on. Turn to your neighbor and say, wake up. And that's served for two reasons, not just for the sermon, but some of you guys are falling asleep. Amen. So this text here in Romans chapter 13, verse 11 and 14, it's a stay woke type of passage that reads this. And I'll be reading it to your hearing in the New International Version. It says, and do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. And then it says, the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So it says, it gives us instructions. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. But it suggests that we do this. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Can I tell you that this text this morning, family, is this. This text is referring to God's people and God's church to wipe the sleep out of our eyes and wake up because the time of the Lord is soon. Now, this is good news, especially from the Adventist context. Why? Because if you didn't know, in October 22, 1844, this came to light to show us and reveal to us who we are as a people. Can I tell you that our church is not a denomination, but I think some of us have gotten out of this idea. If you look at the history of our church, we are, we, we are a movement. You are part of a movement. And a movement is something that doesn't stay stagnant, but is constantly working out its differences and challenging ourselves through the word of God to see where God wants us to be. In October 22, 1844, we had a bunch of people that desired to be with Jesus. 
We might have got the date wrong again. Remember, we, we, we might have gotten uh, that part wrong, but our intentions and the motives were right. There were people that just wanted to see Jesus, who were tired of the things that were going around them. That said, look, I will give away all my things and all my possessions just to simply wait for this date. And I can imagine these people, some of them, and I talked about this at our board meeting. Because when we, when we have board meeting, it's at 7.30 in the morning on a Sunday. All right, so to wake up for a board meeting on Sunday at 7.30, I told them, look, this reminds me of people that were waiting in 1844 who was excited to see Jesus. And you're excited to do board meeting. Amen. I had to challenge our board. And I says, you know why? It's because watch this now. I, I believe that God is looking for morning people. He is looking for morning people. And, and, and some of us aren't morning people. Let's be honest. Like I, I woke up and I get, and the morning people are like this. I woke up, I drove up to the church, and I seen Dave. Whenever you see Dave here in the morning, he's just, he's just on the go. He is active. Like I would in some circles, I say he was bright eyed and bushy tailed. He was so excited to be here. And I saw other people prepping for their, their classes. I saw the, the young classes and people setting up things and greeting people. And, and th this, is the, this is the excitement. God is looking for people who would wake up every morning and not hold their head down, but to be thankful that God has given us life and he's given us purpose. You see, some of us aren't morning people. Let's be honest. Right. And, and I remember I used to work and I wasn't a morning person. You know, I'm still I'm still getting there. But the person that irritated me the most at work was that guy that was there already before I got there. It was like, good morning. How you doing? And I'm like, uh, I'm not there yet. Let's. Uh... <laughs> They're so excited to see you to, you know, and, and God is looking for you see, because here's the case. Some of us. Some of us are, are awake, but we're still asleep. What the text is saying this, he says, some of us, we look like we're awake, but spiritually we're dead. We're physically awake, but spiritually we need to be resurrected. And I don't say this to, 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 to knock on anybody. I, I'm just saying because in order for us to get to where God needs us to be, we need to know our condition. And once we understand the condition, God offers us a cure. Amen. He gives you this, this, this cure. You see, we are a faith tradition that is founded on people who want to see Jesus. Can I, can I add this, Derek? Because sleeping when you need to be awake can be deadly. Yep. Yep. I had a niece that, that's, that sleepwalks, right? It's the, the, the strangest thing that, you know, and every time I'd be at their house, they'd be like, you know, be careful for so-and-so because she, you know, in the middle of the night, you'll just see her walking, in a, you know. And to me, that's scary, right? For young people, you're like just, you're watching TV or you're in the front and you just see somebody walking by. <laughs> and I was, and, and it, was, it was to a point where they said sometimes she would walk outside and there would be a, a playground set, you know, out in front and she'd go sit and she'd swing on the swing. That's, that's, can, can I share this? It's like, and they were so scared because she was putting herself in a position that was detrimental and almost deadly for her life, but yet she didn't know or realize that she was doing it. And a lot of us are like that. We, we put ourselves in positions that are deadly. We put our, let me, let me, let me, let's go deeper. We put ourselves in relationships that are detrimental to our spiritual walk. We, we put ourselves in an environment that is not conducive to that of a kingdom lifestyle. And then we wonder to ourselves, that why, why, why is all this happening to me? I'm like, we become a product of that which we put ourselves into. And God is saying this. He's like, wake up. He says, wake up. You see, so, 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 see I, let me break this down for you. It says here in verse 11. And do this understanding the present time. This is the hour. The hour has already come for you. And here's this word. It says to wake up. Now, Paul is saying here in, in the text, in the Greek, the word, again, I paid for it. So I'm going to give it to you for free. The word in the Greek is called egerthani. Right? Say it. Egerthani. Good. See? See? I'm just, it's, it's, it's a love that keeps on loving. Now, egerthani in the text means this. When it's used figuratively, 
It doesn't mean to wake up from a, from a sleep or a slumber. It actually means this, to wake up from inactivity or obscurity. Did you get that? So when the Bible and Paul is writing here in the book of Romans, he's saying, you're not just waking up from a sleep. He says, I need you to wake up from inactivity. He says, because what you're doing is looking busy but not really being busy. And I need you to wake up from, from inactivity so you can be active in what I am doing in and around this world. You see, some of us suffer from what we call sleep apathy. And some of you can probably understand sleep apnea too because, you, you know, the, the problem with that is this. Right? If I'm just, I, want to, I want to try to make it plain. If sleep apnea suffers because when people sleep without enough oxygen right, going into the body, they actually wake up more tired. Right? So, so it is, it's, it's, it's that uh, CPAP machine that allows them to open up their airways so that when they sleep, they, you could sleep for a couple hours and feel as if you had a whole night's rest simply because you're getting the oxygen that you need. What Paul is saying is this. He says, I, I, need, to, I, need, to, I need you to breathe life. I need to breathe life in you so that you, you may get the, the, the areas in your life that are lacking oxygen so that you can live. You can thrive. Verse 12 goes on to say this. The night is nearly over and the day is almost here. And I love this. It says, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the what? The armor of light. Again, he's talking about mourning people here. You see, Paul starts by giving us an image of battle gear. He uses the word armor, or, or if, if I can suggest that, you got to understand when you're reading this text, Paul's painting a picture that we are all in a battle. And when you're in a battle, you got to be able to test your armor. Some of us wake up and, you know, like if you're in a battle, please don't come in your PJs. Amen. Because he wants to make sure that not only, not only are you ready for battle, but that you're dressed for battle. So he says, put aside these things. If you read 1 Samuel and it talks about, I love, I love how David has so much faith, right, at, at a very young age, who goes to the battlefield. His dad sends them to take some food to his brothers, right? And they get there, right? And, and as he's walking there, he overhears, right, this Philistine, this giant, right, not only mocking his people, but uh, degrading his God. He gets so upset that he's, he's walking around and wondering, who's going to say something? Who will stand up to this giant? Nobody was found. Every time he came out every morning to speak, the, the army of Israel would, would back up, and, and they, just like a dog who's scared, would tuck their tails and, and, and start to maneuver themselves in a way that is out of harm's danger. The word gets around to King Saul, and David meets with him, Right? And King Saul, you know, I can imagine, was probably back in his tent, too. He was probably further away from the front line. He's having this conversation with David. And David's like, look, no, 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 I'll go do it. I don't have a problem. As a matter of fact, if you hear the verbiage that David is speaking, he's, he's calling this giant, you uncircumcised Philistine. He, he, he is speaking against God's enemy in such a way, with such faith, that he already knew that he has this battle won, so long as the Lord was with him. So what does Saul do? Saul says, well, come here, let me, let me give you some of my armor. And he starts to put the helmet on him, and, and then this breastplate, and he, he starts to dress David up. And a lot of times, the enemy will do this. He'll take you to places, and he'll put things on you that don't fit you, that's not part of your character, that isn't conducive to a kingdom living, and that, 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 that you, will, you would conform to. But just like David, who once it got on him, he said to himself, ah, uh, this, this doesn't fit me. Now watch this, because if you understand uh, the, the battle tactics and also in history of uh, how things went uh, back in the biblical days, uh, you would know that the Israelites did not wear armor. The, only the highest generals or those that, that took place uh, uh, in positions of authority were the only ones that wore armor. Now the enemy, everybody on that side had armor. And what I'm saying here is this. How we're supposed to beat the enemy when we look like the enemy. How, how is it that we are supposed to love others when we ourselves are trying to deal with compassion? 
How is it that we can talk about faith if we doubt? How is it that we talk about compassion if we judge? How is it that we can talk about love if we hate? How is it that we can talk about change if we fear? How can we move forward if we lack faith? I want you to notice something about the next verse. That Paul talks about the things that entice the human flesh or these things in life that can put kinks in our armor. In verse 13, he goes on to say, let us behave decently as in the daytime. You know why he says this in the daytime? I found this out as a young person. All right. The reason why a lot of the parties happen at night. Right. And some of some of the, you know, when I was out there. Now, now I'm saying this B.C., before Christ. As a matter of fact, you know, the gas lamp district, I'm telling you, right now in the day, it just seems like a nice place you can walk and have restaurants. But when the sun goes down, people used to say the best clubs are the darkest clubs. And have you ever wondered why the clubs that you're in don't have any windows or walls that shows people? Because they don't want you to, they don't want to see what's going on, on the inside, people to look out from the outside. And it says this, it, this, it says, come, coming out of the light. God, God has set aside all these things, and he says, coming out of the light. So watch this. this. Can, can, can I share this just quick acronym with you? Because sin isn't something that was exterior. In verse 13, it goes on to say, it says, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness. Right? This is stuff that people see from the physical. We see people when they're misbehaving because they're altered by some alcohol substance or whatever. This is something we see in the physical. So it starts there, not in sexual immorality or debauchery. These are, again, these are things that we start to see with our eyes. But then it goes internal, not in dissension and jealousy. These are things that happen internally. So the sin gets darker and darker and darker. Can I tell you, in Arizona a few years back, they had what we call rolling blackouts. And the rolling blackouts happens when too much power is surged at one time. And it always happened in the summer. Because if you've ever been in Arizona in the summer, <sighs> make, sure, make sure you don't try to walk around. It feels as if your feet and your shoes are melting to the pavement. That's how hot it is there. So during the summer, everybody would turn on their air condition. Everyone would constantly try to stay cool. And this would send a surge out to the circuit breakers or the, to, the, to, to, to electricity, um, the area where they, they had all these, these things uh, welded up for, for, to, to provide electricity. And, and it would shut everything out. So they would have what we call rolling blackouts where streets and cities would just black out until they could get there and repair it. Can I tell you that sin is just like that? That the deeper and the darker that we get into sin the more that we will start to black out. And can I, can I make it even more, let me, let me bring it just a little bit more home. Us as individuals, right, this blackout first starts with us. Then it starts to affect the people around us, which is the immediate people, it's the people in our family. Once I black out, my house blacks out. And once the home blacks out, the street blacks out. And once the street blacks out, then the block and then the city blacks out. And then the city blacks out and then the community blacks out. And if you could continue down this, this, this process, you'll understand why we live in such a dark world. But God calls us to be the light. Can I share something with you? Like when, before I met the Lord, right? Me and my wife, we bought a house uh, out in Reno Valley, and I wasn't in the Lord. And, and I, I, my, my, my neighbors, God bless them for surviving with me for that long. Because we had all sorts of people coming in and out of that house. We were doing things in there that was, that was not legal, that was not of God. Dude. And, and my neighbors would oftentimes, when they see me come home, they would either go in their house. Nobody would talk to me. They're like, here's, this, here's these guys that are in front of the house from Friday all the way till Monday. Right? And, and you know what's crazy? is like when I was out in the world, I, I used to think to myself, through this entire weekend, we'd end up, Hanging out on Monday, go, man, this, this was the life. But yet we spent the entire weekend in the garage <laughs> telling same stories that we told each other last week and acting like they were all brand new. <laughs> oh, but can I tell you this? Can I, can I tell you this? When I met the Lord, my entire neighborhood knew that I became a Christian. 
the reason why, and it wasn't that the people weren't coming over anymore, right? People weren't coming over to party. They were coming over for Bible studies. Instead of us blaring music out of our cars and out of the garage, they started to hear praise and worship songs being sung out of my living room. We would open the windows to make sure that if we're going to worship, the entire block is going to worship. If we were going to praise, the entire block was going to, whether they liked it or not. And can I tell you, it made a difference because then I started to see the little kids started to play in the daytime, even when I was home. <laughs> Neighbors started to smile at me and wave. They would stop and talk to me. My neighbor across the street came over and actually talked to me. And let me tell you something. It's like when, we, when, we, when we're ready to put away the deeds of darkness and set these things aside, God sets us up to not only be a blessing to our home, but everybody else that is around us. In verse 14, as we close with this text, it says this. It says, instead of all that stuff that we tend to put on ourselves, it says, rather close yourselves with who? With the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Paul answers for us, and oftentimes this question that he tells us to get up and get dressed. And and notice I said this. Notice I said you had to wake up before you get dressed, right? Or wake up, get dressed, and then go to work. Don't just wake up and go to work. Or there's this process that takes place here. Why? It's just because close ourselves with Jesus Christ. Because the, the, the last time I checked, family, we, we are in a war. We, we are in a battle. Remember, remember the, the, we, we were saying that, that the Christian walk is both battles and blessings. Battles. And the last time I woke up, we were in a war. And this war is this, and some of us might not see this, but in, in the spiritual realm, right, we, we understand this, that we do not battle against flesh or blood. From the moment that you wake up, there's, there's things pulling you one way or the other. And you're wrestling with this. And God gives us this answer. He says, put on the armor of God and put on Jesus Christ. Can I just pause and just, just add this in there? Never once as it says in the Bible that the battle that we're fighting against is with each other. Let me give you an analogy. Like, some of us have so much turmoil within the church than we do with people that are outside of the church. And if you look at the way that God created us, never once did God create the hand, right, to, to beat yourself up. Right? You, have you ever seen somebody walk down the street and just, you know, maybe you have, but I mean, in their right mind. <laughs> But, but, but for us to beat ourselves up is abnormal. God didn't create the body to hurt itself. Just like he didn't create the body of Christ to hurt each other. When sister or brother so-and-so is doing this to you, understand it's not them doing it, but they're being used. Whenever you feel offended by somebody in church, understand this, if you can look beyond that the the best way the enemy can divide the church is by dividing the people. We are not meant to fight each other. We are not battling against flesh and blood. I'll leave you with this text in Ephesians 6, 10, and 17, and she was already there. It says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And he says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is a repeat of what it was mentioned in Romans. It says this, therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, it says this in verse 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, it says take up your shield of faith 
But you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. One of my greatest um, times that I had in ministry was when I was the head deacon for the church that I got baptized under. As soon as I got baptized, some of you know the story, I got baptized, I was I was put to work immediately. The pastor saw it within myself to make me a youth leader. I was still kicking substance abuses, and, and I was still having the shakes from not drinking, and I had dreadlocks, and it was, it was crazy. And, I'm a, you know, without the suit, I'm all tatted up. And he was like, you need to be one of the youth directors. He saw something that I didn't see in myself. And then they made me the head deacon of the church. I was like, are you sure you want to give me the keys to the church? They're like, just don't collect the offerings. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but what happened was this. I, mean, I fell in love with just serving God, that I was the first one at the church before anybody else got there. I got there. I opened the church up. I sat in the front row every Sabbath morning. I had a little worship and a devotion with God. Then I went out and served. So I served as a deacon for a little bit over two years as a head deacon. The same pastor who asked me to be the youth leader and the deacon asked me to preach for Mother's Day. Now watch what happens. When I, when I became a deacon to the church, let me back up just a little bit. My father understood that I was so removed from the church, I didn't have a suit. So he takes me to downtown Los Angeles. If you ever need good suits, let me know. And this guy, my dad's friend, my dad always, some of you guys have those dads that always have a hookup. So he took me to Big L's spot, and he got me suited up, and my dad bought me my first deacon suit. We all know the color of a deacon suit. It was black and white. I said, I look more like a security guard, a bouncer, than I do a deacon. But he bought me a suit, and it's the same suit that I wore for two years as a head deacon. Now, when the pastor asked me, Right, to preach my first sermon on Mother's Day, my dad says, son, you need a preaching suit. So he took me back two years later to Big L, and he bought me a blue suit. And I preached my first sermon in this blue suit on Mother's Day. Now what happened, the Lord took over from there, that they started to add me to the preaching list. And every time I wore that blue suit, the young people would say, you preaching today, aren't you? All the youth, all they knew I was preaching that day because they saw the suit. It's for, and I don't say this prideful, but for some reason, they respected the suit. They respected the uniform. Our military families that are here understand what it means to put on that uniform. There is a meaning behind that uniform. There is a presence about it when you wear that uniform. There's a sense of authority, not, not abused authority, but there's a, there's a sense of authority when you put on that uniform. And just like in the military, in order for you to put on that uniform, you got to be able to abide by certain values. We as Christians... And as of the body of Christ, have a set of values that God expects and encourages us to have. So that when we're wearing the uniform, people respect the uniform. And I want South Bay to be the church that brings back value, honor, and respect to this uniform. Because for so long, this uniform has been used and abused. That when people see us now, we look just like everybody else. And I believe that God is going to use this church and this young generation. Because the Bible tells us, in the spirit of prophecy, is it's the young people who are going to finish the work. And us collectively as a church body of Christ, when we put on the armor of God, 
we will start to look, act, love, and serve like our Father. Young man, let me use you in an illustration as I close. Before I met the Lord, I used to despise looking at myself in the mirror. Why? Because I didn't like who I saw. Oftentimes I would wake up in a drunken stupor, holes in the walls, broken windows in my car, broken relationships, family members calling me, telling me they don't want to see me ever again. And I used to hate looking in the mirror because I didn't like who I saw. But when I met the Lord, I started to put on the armor. It says, put on, put on the armor of Jesus. He gave me a new suit. Would you say amen? amen. That now when I, when I look in the mirror, watch, because the Bible tells us this, if Christ is before us, who could be? If Christ be for us, who can be against us? Now that when I look in the mirror, I don't see myself, but I see the Father. And I'm this little young man behind my Father. That now when I see and look in the mirror, I don't see a reflection of myself, but I see a reflection of Jesus. Thank you, young man. I see a reflection of Jesus. I see a reflection of Jesus. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, our, our goal here today, God, is not only to receive your word, but also internalize it so we can make it flesh. And Father, just as you came here through your son, Jesus Christ, who claims that anything that he does, you do, because he doesn't do anything that is apart from the Father's will, Lord, we pray for that same passion, that same life that Jesus walked. So that, God, when we put Jesus on, when people see us, they don't see Meshach. They see Jesus. They don't see us. They see Jesus. And what better time today than for us as a church, as individuals, as Christians, to wake up and to notice the chaos that is around us. And to be a light in a dark world. To be the hope for those in disparity. To be the one to love in those that have been rejected. To be compassionate to those that have been judged. To be kind to those that have been hurt. To give strength to those that are weak. May we be the hands and feet of your son Jesus Christ. That as we leave this place... We may be a blessing to others. And Father, for anybody here, I, I want to give this opportunity. If there's anybody here that, that wants to meet Jesus or accept Jesus for the first time, you feel the Lord tugging at your heart, then today, just wherever you're at, I want you, I want you just to raise your hand. It says, Lord, I want to receive you today. And then I also want to add this challenge. If you, if you want to do Bible studies, or if you want to just talk a little bit more about who this God is and want to know more about our faith, please see myself or any of our elders and leaders. We, we want to walk through this journey with you. God, please bless the hands that are raised, but the hearts that are also here. So that, God, that we are very responsive to that of what your Holy Spirit leads and guides us to be. So to your honor and glory, we ask these things. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen and amen.